Welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is Ipshita Chanda and I teach comparative literature at Jadavpur University. Today we are looking at the second module in the course Literatures of Africa and the Caribbean. And this module is about the issues that surround the literatures written in English in Africa and the Caribbean islands. The reason why we look at these issues is because they construct the world of the text and the world that the text is trying to convey to us. So the aim of this module is to look at the issues which occur in and around the literatures of Africa and the Caribbean so that we may enter the world of the text. And these issues concern language, race and gender. As we have learned in the first module in this course, the colonial policy on culture and education had a great deal of impact on well, the cultures of the colony and also remained as residual in the cultures that we find in these areas after the departure of the colonizers. So, the cultural policy of the colonizers, especially the English, which we have considered earlier, which was called indirect rule, has an impact upon the lives of the colonized and therefore on their literature. This colonial cultural policy concerned the issues that we were, that we are about to look at, that is language, race and gender. We will begin with language. The first question that we need to ask is how did the English language enter the colonies? The policy of education that was propagated by the English colonizers both in the Caribbean and in Africa had a lot to do with the way in which English came into the colonies and that is what we will consider in detail now. As we remember from the first module, Macaulay's Minute on Education in 1835 laid the seeds of or laid the foundation of the fo following policy on education whereby Macaulay wanted to create a class of Indians because this policy was first started in India and then applied to Africa and the Caribbean. He wanted to create a class of people who were English in their thoughts and ideas who would be a buffer between the colonial ruler and the colonized ruled. English became a way of class formation in the colonies. A distinction was created between those who learnt and knew English and therefore became part of the colonial administration and those who were the colonized and the ruled who did not know English and therefore had a great distance from the colonial centers of power. So from the very introduction of English into the colonies, English was a power language there. In the Caribbean, however, this situation was even more complicated because ultimately in the Caribbean, English turned to be the link language between the different communities who came from different parts of Africa who were forcibly brought into the Caribbean and became slaves. Also, English was the way in which they communicated with each other and with the colonizer and the white supervisors who made them work on the plantations in the Caribbean. Besides, English also became their only means of communication with people of other nationalities who were brought to the Caribbean as indentured labor. And amongst these other nationalities were also the Indians. So, the Africans who came from different parts of Africa the Indians who came from different parts of India and the colonizers who came from different parts of Europe found a common language to communicate in, in the Anglophone colonies. But each of these languages contributed or added on to English and changed its character completely from what it was in England. So the kind of English that grew in the Caribbean was known as Creole. So the English that was used in the Caribbean was marked by 
an inherent plurality that is it had words from all the languages of all the different races and communities that lived in the Caribbean. Creole originally was thought of as mispronounced French. Actually, and I quote from Thomas here, members of Trinidad's working class were being rendered voiceless by legal and religious institutions because they were Creole speakers and the religious and the legal institutions transacted their business only in pure standard English. So, Thomas felt that it was necessary to introduce certain grammatical laws into Creole so that it could become a language which was at par with the English language that they had inherited. Which is why he asserted that it is not just mispronounced French or mispronounced English or mispronounced Portuguese for that matter. Since Thomas was uh, an accredited philologist, his establishment of Creole as a language not only of speaking but also of education and then of literature was an important intervention in the colonial policy of language in the Caribbean. The institutionalization of Creole as a langu language of literature has a history which is common to all people's struggles everywhere. Deprived of education due to their slave status, the newly freed population of African descent in the Caribbean aspired to power and social status by learning correct English. That immediately created a rift in the society. Amongst the higher class of people or the freed, freed slaves who could afford or who were given an English education and those who could not afford and were not therefore given an English education. So Creole was identified with the lower classes and the poor and English was identified with the higher classes and those who were closer to the colonizer because they knew the colonizer's language. A long movement to establish Creole as the language of literature began in the Caribbean and culminated in works like the West Indian narrative an introductory anthology written in 1996 by Kenneth Ramchand. And this followed the ex was followed by the establishment of the Caribbean Examination Council in 1972. This body gradually built up a literature syllabus for the secondary educational level based on Caribbean rather than on British literary production. In Africa too, the educated middle class was akin to the Babus of India, the writers who were trained in fact to become clerks in the establishment of the colonizers. There too a class of English knowing people was created and these people felt that they were closer to the colonizers because they knew the colonizers language. So we see that English as a power language in the colonies created a new class of people which was not this class was not based on their economic abilities but rather on their intellectual and linguistic abilities which formed the basis of their further economic advancement. Following European contact, most of sub-Saharan Africa that used to transact business in local languages without scripts or without written literature now came into contact with the European languages disseminated through colonial education with written literatures. The latter claimed civilized status on the basis of the fact that they were written and therefore more evolved and developed than purely or merely oral composition. So a tension between the local language writer and the English writer grew in the colonies and one of the points to be remembered here was that a lot of the local languages in Africa did not have scripts. So the first time anything was written in an African language, it was written in the received Roman script. And so ro the Roman script had literatures written in African languages as well as literature written in European languages in it. This created a multiplicity in the literary scene of, the, of Africa, just as it had created a distinction between the Creole speakers and the English speakers in the Caribbean. This tension between literatures written in the local language and literatures written in English gave rise to what is known 
in the study of African literatures in English as the language debate. In June 1962, there was a meeting at Makarere in Uganda titled A Conference of African Writers of English Expression. In the essay, English and the African Writer, written by Chinua Achebe in 1965 in the journal called Transition, Achebe clarified the relation between the colonized writer and the colonial language. Prior to the publication of Achebe's report and ruminations on the 1962 meeting, the Nigerian writer and language activist Obi Wali had written an essay on the same conference. The essay was called The Dead End of African Literature and Wali argued that African literatures written in European languages were killing African languages and therefore leading African literature to a dead end. He questioned their artistic validity and the autonomy of African literature if it was written in an European language. According to Wally, the whole uncritical acceptance of English and French as the inevitable medium of educated African writing is misdirected and has no chance of advancing African culture and African literature. In response to this, Ngugi Wa Thiong O used Wali's position to propose the abolition of the English department in the University of Nairobi in Kenya, where he at that point headed the English department. Along with two colleagues, Taban Lo Leong and Henry Owur Anyumba, Ngugi proposed the abolition of the English department based upon three particular aspects. Ngugi explains his proposal thus, in asking for a change of name for the English department to simply literature and the reorganization of the curriculum so that African literature and the related literature would constitute the inner circle with English and other European literatures in translation in the outer circles, our proposal questioned the cognitive process, what was central and what was ancillary and their relation to the acquisition of knowledge in a post-colonial context. A debate followed in which the university, not surprisingly, rejected the paper which called for the abolition of the English language. Wole Soenka in 1975 argued for a continental language instead. He felt that a pan-African language understood by all the Africans would replace European world languages like English and allow the Africans to talk about their own lives in their own language. However, we have independent African states now and so it becomes a daunting task as to how to evolve a common language that everybody from the Arab elements in the North African areas to the Zulus in South Africa would understand. Achebe proposed that English must be, and I quote here, tamed, nativized and actively manipulated to admit its foreign surroundings. Thus, English must be compelled to blend with the environment of its users, thereby producing artistic work that will be aesthetically pleasing. It is by doing so that Africans can hope to have the best African literary works in English and to achieve an extraordinary novelty of expression and yet all of them would blossom on the native root. The demand for African languages as the medium of written literature and the encouragement of knowledge production in local languages culminated in writers and scholars from all regions of Africa gathering in Asamara in Eritrea from January 11th to 17th in the year 2000. At the conference which was titled Against All Odds, the African Languages and Literatures into the 21st Century. This is also known as the Asamara Declaration and this asserted that African languages are essential for the decolonization of African minds and for the African Renaissance. 
This was the first conference of African writers, scholars, editors, journalists and publishers on African soil. The second issue that we need to discuss is the issue of race. Critics have pointed out that anthropology or the study of man is a discipline related to colonization. Western scholars began to study the populations they encountered in their travels to find resources for capital. Wole Soenka was given a year's appointment at Christ Church College in Cambridge. But despite the fact that he was by then a writer of no small repute, he was not located in a literature department. Rather, he had to ex lecture on African culture and African literatures in the cultural anthropology department at Cambridge. To quote Soinka, nobody knew a mythical beast called African literature in England. This prompts Soinka to review his theory of literature, combining it with performance and linking it to the world which produces it. The image of primitive African scientifically and morally justified the treatment of the slave and the colonized as civilized and subhuman. The theories that tried to explain mental and physical capacity by skin color and biometrics were formulated and then institutionalized as the basis of racial discrimination and exploitation. This reached its height in the apartheid doctrine of racial segregation that was prevalent in South Africa and propagated by the Dutch Boers who settled in southern Africa. Racist ideology played a great role in the formulation of colonial policy. In the Caribbean, there was the, what is known as the tripartite structure of race. The francophone Caribbean theorist Franz Fanon affirms that the fact of blackness lies not in the body, but in the cultural disciplining that teaches us what to see. I quote from Fano, below the corporeal schema is a historical racial schema. Constructing a racial narrative through which we come to understand and interact with our world. As a result, black people tend either to succumb to the mimetic impulse through which they imitate the colonizer or they move towards the valorization of blackness that the negritude writers propagated. Neither of these responses, says Fano, is adequate for colonialism because neither of them offers a viable alternative to the black man. Historically, colonial hierarchies molded the different races in the Caribbean into their social roles, beginning with specific types of education. As we have seen with the propagation of education in, in India, different people were allowed access to the English language and on the basis of that found their own places in the colonial hierarchy. So race itself, just like language, or rather race and language were wedded together through colonial policy in order to subjugate and put in their place the colonized, whether in Africa or in the Caribbean. That the ideal of transnationalism grew and transnationalism was a strategy adopted by the self-taught Afro-Caribbean intellectuals of the Anglophone Caribbean islands who aspired to better the colonizer in the performance of his own culture. For instance, the valuing of the opportunity to master classical studies became the way for the intellectual of color to claim and demonstrate his equality with the civilized colonizer. This is what Pierre Bourdieu calls the educational capital. It is a common phenomenon in the earliest stages of the colonies encouraged by benefits both of financial and social status in acquiring the education of the colonizer. The very notion of the 19th century English civilized world carried within it an expectation of international sophistication. The colonized intellectuals proved that this sophistication was not limited to the English people alone. What were the results of the dual policy that was adopted by the colonizer with respect to language and race? 
transnationalism as we have seen was in fact one of the results of this policy because race is also while it divides the black from the white it also creates the foundation of solidarity in a place like the Caribbean where different people from different parts of Africa with different genealogies and communities were forced to live together. Thus, the Caribbean linguist Thomas, to whom we have referred earlier, argues that the relationship between the educated black men and their unenlightened fellow blacks has nothing of the cynicism of Englishmen towards their less favored countrymen. The common yoke of racism creates a solidarity between different classes of the col colonized society. So while the colonizer was trying to introduce a class distinction through the introduction of English, the colonized were resisting this very class distinction by firstly turning towards a composite language like Creole and secondly through the racial solidarity that they felt and the common history of slavery that they wanted to work against. The commonality built upon racial, racial exploitation and dispossession also connects Africa with those of African descent who were forcibly scattered across the world as slaves. The common problems of racial discrimination and the history of slavery and colonization of different kinds have created shared political and cultural agendas for Africa and the members of its diaspora. And two of these ideologies which were espoused by mainland Africans and the members of the diaspora were negritude and pan-Africanism. Fano described the psychopathology of race by saying that it relates Africans on the continent to those in the diaspora while the diaspora shares a common origin in the continent. Hence, African diasporic cultures in the Americas are rooted in the remembered and retrieved culture of Africa, giving rise to a confluence of identities based on race, location and history, resulting in a politics and aesthetics of transnationalism. As a political ideology, transnationalism means the ability to judge when and how to invoke or construct local roots and global ways or roots in the fight for equality and freedom. For most inhabitants of the Caribbean, this is a known condition beginning with the movement to the island from the place of their origin. For the slaves and, the, and later the indentured laborers from Asia, the place of origin was lost forever. So they had to find a new world in which they all belonged to the same place and they were all oppressed by the same race. This creates a transnational solidarity and a community characteristic of the Caribbean. Another form of transnationalism results from the culture of colonial education which we have discussed in detail earlier. This was of a special nature in the Caribbean. Its effects may be seen in the rebuttal by Thomas of the English travel writer J. A. Froud. Proud described the Caribbean as a place of sterile imitations. Thomas criticized Froud's own limited international knowledge. He pointed out that Froud thought of all Africans as similar to each other, where, whereas they all came from different parts of Africa and had their own cultures and their own languages. So, in calling them imitators, Froud was actually obfuscating and confusing the basis of their identities. Thomas constructs the idea of transnationalism on the very basis which leads to the maximum oppression of the people of African descent, that is race. He attempts to explain the natural crossing of national boundaries by Caribbean individuals with reference to regional and racial similarities rather than through the relations between the colonizing or the slave owning societies. As an aesthetic that guides the creation of literature, transnationalism may be exemplified by the venerated oral poet Louise Bennett 
who apart from being a national poet in Jamaican Creole, is also influential in black British poetry, resulting from her residence in Great Britain in the mid-1940s and the early 1950s. Louise Bennett's writing shows the result of contact across national boundaries, intertwining cultures, histories and topographies from the colonizer's culture with one's own dispossessed cultural memories to create a Caribbean culture, whether it is called Jamaican, Trinidadian or Barbadian. This is made possible by melding both imported and local traditions. Responding to global migrations, modernizations and decolonizations that have shaped the world in the 21st century. Besides this, in current times, the many varied and tremendously popular forms of music derived from African sources and audible all across the world offer many sources to study the aesthetics of transnationalism. The last issue that we discuss is especially important and most especially contentious and it is the issue of gender. Gender is both a social construct helping us make sense of temporally and spatially located social worlds and a social relation that enters into and constitutes other relations in society. Like all social relations in colonized space, relations of gender are also influenced by the nature of colonization and the policy of the metropolis towards the periphery. These relations differ in the specific stages of the process of capital formation and accumulation. The demands of capital and particular forms of gender hierarchization were simultaneously imposed upon colonized societies. Through the attempt to integrate the colonized economy into the structure of col colonial and then global capital. The entirety of women's lives in post-colonial or third world societies is affected by such policy and ideological interventions. And the so, so the space for feminist struggle here includes all areas of women's lives. Contact with the colonizing societies could be realized in the form of resistance, negotiation or assimilation. Generally, colonial contact resulted in the convergence of three interacting influences, the pre-colonial, the colonial and through their interaction, the post-colonial. The interaction between these three influences form the materiality of gender and gender relations in post-colonial societies and African and Caribbean societies are no exception. Scholars have identified the difference in goals and strategies between feminisms located in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, and Western feminisms that were responses to metropolitan industrial societies. Existing gender organization in African societies could be matrifocal or patrifocal, meaning that descent was traced from either the mother or the father. So it is to be noted that descent was not always traced from the father alone. Besides this, even after marriage, some societies were very local, whereas in some societies it was necessary for the man who married to relocate to the village of his wife. Besides this, many African societies practiced polygamy, that is the marriage of more than one woman to a single man. The introduction of Western gender ideology distorted the local gender practices of pre-colonial society and created a social ideology of gender in which the oppressive practices of Western patriarchy further exacerbated the oppression of local patriarchies which were traditional without providing women the support of existing gender and age-based societies that used to protect them in pre-colonial times. In Ama Atta Aidu's Changes, A Love Story and in Buchi Amecheta's Kehinde, this clash of gender ideologies and effects upon women in traditionally polygamous matrifocal societies, that is Fanti in the case of Ama Atta Aidu 
and Igbo in the case of Buchi and Macheta, respectively, are represented. The gradual adaptation of Western gender practices and the effect upon women who were themselves opened to the influence of colonizers' cultures as a form of modernity through colonial education is explicitly dealt with in Sisi Dangarenka's Nervous Conditions or Buchi Emicheta's Joys of Motherhood. In Amata Aidu's Our Sister Killjoy, we meet a West African female protagonist who resists this colonization of the mind by calling her vision memories of a black-eyed squint. The interpretation of traditional gender ideology hinges on the economic system of polygamy. In societies where men were allowed to take more than one wife, they had to have enough land to give to each wife to farm before they decided on marrying more than one woman. This also led to a particular kind of family organization which was not common in the West. The family unit in a polygamous compound was formed of the mother and her children. The father was present but not in the form of the patriarch that we know him to be in Western societies. The father's rights over the children were acknowledged but he had little role in their daily upbringing. In fact, the reason he gave every woman he married a piece of land to farm was because the woman herself rather than the father was responsible for the upbringing of her child. So the family economic unit also consisted of the mother and her children with the father playing an absent role. This kind of polygamous compound in an Igbo family is seen in Chinua Achebe's uh, chief protagonist Okonkwo's household in Things Fall Apart. The role of the father is thus not the same as that of the patriarch of a monogamous Christian family, where the father controls the lives of the family. In African societies, complementarity between genders rather than a hierarchy between genders was imposed. Since women's ability to give birth was seen as beyond male control and giving women additional mysterious and often ambiguous powers. Other forms of organization like among the Akan speaking people of West Africa also existed. Amongst the Akan speaking people of West Africa, the entire state is ruled not by the king but by the queen mother and she was the source of power and governance. However, the introduction of colonial administration and economic structures followed the colonial gender ideology, which meant that all credit for agriculture and all support and help for agriculture was given to men rather than to women because the colonizers gender ideology did not think in terms of women's resources and men's resources being separate despite the fact that they belonged to the same conjugal family. This separation of conjugal resources characterized the complementary gender systems in African societies, but they were overlaid by the patriarchal colonial gender ideology and so these existing pre-colonial systems were completely distorted. Only those elements which favored men remained both of the colonial ideology as well as of the pre-colonial ideology. All economic support to agriculture therefore, which came from the colonizers was given to men rather than to women and traditionally in African societies women grew the food crops and men helped them to grow the food crops which meant that women were in charge of feeding the society. However, when the colonizers wanted to cultivate cash crops they gave most of the subsidies and the support for agriculture to the men. So ultimately African farmers ended up growing more cash crops than food crops which led to the continuous situation of hunger and famine that plagues many African societies today. Thus the impoverishment of the colonies went hand in hand with gender ideology, racial discrimination and the imposition of a colonial educational policy 
upon the colonized. Now this is the background to most of the work that we will be studying in this course and so these ideas regarding race, language and gender will keep returning to us as we move on. Details about these issues of race, gender and educational policy will be found in the e-text and in the learn more sections so that you have a wider and a deeper idea of these issues which will inform your reading of the literature.